Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our budget, our priorities. You're so pleased that you joined WAND for this presentation today, and we're very excited to hear from Jasmine Tucker from National Priorities Project. My name is Adzi Vokiwa. I'm the Senior Program Associate at WAND, and I'll be running the technology behind the scenes. Before we get started with our presentation, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. All attendees are going to be muted during the presentation. You can submit any questions that you have for Jasmine by typing them into the question section of your panel, which should be on the right-hand side of your computer screen. I'll ask these questions aloud to Jasmine after she finishes her presentation. If you have any technical difficulties, please contact GoToWebinar support directly at 1-800-263-6317. And this webinar will be recorded and posted to the WAND website and YouTube page uh, in case you want to revisit the presentation. So before we get started, uh, let me go ahead and tell you more about our presenter. Jasmine Tucker is Senior Research Analyst at National Priorities Project, and her work there focuses on federal spending, tax policy, social insurance, safety net programs, and especially Pentagon spending. Jasmine has a wealth of experience and great education. I'll let you tell her a little, tell you a little bit more about herself. And we're very excited to have her here this afternoon for the presentation. So uh, without any more delay, let me go ahead and turn it over to Jasmine. Thanks so much, Adzi, and, and thanks um, to Wand and Will for, for having me here to speak today um, about all of the various federal budget proposals that are facing our nation. Um, like Adzi said, I'm, I'm Jasmine Tucker, the, the Senior Research Analyst at the National Priorities Project, um, and the number cruncher behind the visions, analysis, um, and all of the, the federal budget work that we do at National Priorities Project. Um, so this webinar is going to break down some of the key issues in, in the three major budget proposals that have been introduced for fiscal year 2017, um, which begins on October 1st. So one important thing to know about budget proposals for the, for the federal budget is that they reveal a lot about the priority of the lawmakers who introduce them. Um, and since regular people pay the federal government's bills, um, our federal budget should really be a document that reflects the common values that are held by the American people. Um, and so we're going to talk about these three major proposals um, in relation to how they stack up to what polling shows that Americans want. Um, so we're, we're talking about three major budget proposals uh, today, including the President's budget, the House Budget Committee proposal, which was released just yesterday, and the Congressional Progressive Caucus budget. Um, and just to note that that's not necessarily an exhaustive list of, of the proposals that are up for consideration. Uh, for example, budgets are, are often put forward by the Black Caucus. Um, the House Budget Committee Democrats do a proposal as well. Um, but we're just going to focus on, on the three that I mentioned, the President's budget, the House uh, Republican Budget Committee proposal, and the Congressional Progressive caucus budget. So the differences between these, um, these three budget proposals is pretty stark, uh, both in terms of their priorities, but also in terms of how clear a vision they actually present. Um, so for example, if we look at the House proposal, the document is, is fairly light on detail. Um, it makes mention of, of what they call, you know, quote, comprehensive tax reform, but, but we don't actually know what the new tax rates are, they don't mention those. Um, it claims that it's going to spur job creation that stems from spending and tax cuts, but it's not clear how those how those things will play out. Um, and that makes it a little bit difficult for us um, to analyze sort of the real impact of changes. So, so we do our best, but you have to bear with us um, as some of the budgets are, are a little light on detail. So, Let's talk a little bit, um, just for a minute, about the importance of the federal budget. Um, it covers everything from health care to military spending to clean drinking water, and it's live in, in our communities, in our states, um, in our local parks, for example, as food stamp benefits to low-income families, as tax breaks to local businesses, um, just to name a few. So 
So the federal budget really impacts states in a major way. Um, and most state budgets rely on federal dollars for about a quarter, uh, sometimes more, of their total um, state budget. Um, and so federal dollars also affect local towns and cities with, with grants and contracts, um, and federal benefits also go directly to individuals as well. Um, so when we're thinking about the federal budget and the proposals um, to sort of change it, we need to think on a smaller scale um, and about how these huge proposals that are, you know, $4 trillion, um, how those proposals would affect us, would affect our families, our states, and, and the communities that are within them. So I wanted to give an example um, for what the federal budget does for a state. So, so let's, let's take Georgia. Um, Georgia relied on federal dollars for about 37% of its total budget in 2013, um, and about $1.5 billion went to transportation programs, so public airports, mass transit, highways, um, $3.2 billion went to education programs like Head Start, Title I, school meals. Um, but in total, Georgia receives almost $15 billion annually from the federal government. Um, so the second piece, the second way um, that federal dollars come into states is directly to the people, right? So, so state residents. Um, and in Georgia, the average resident received about $5,250 um, from federal benefits such as Medicare, Social Security, student aid, food stamps, unemployment insurance, benefits like that. Um, a third way that money flows into the state is through federal contracts. And as you can see, that's dominated largely um, by defense contracts. Um, and then the last and final way that federal dollars come into states is as compensation to, um, to federal employees. So there's a lot at stake, not just uh, at the federal level, but also at the state level, right? So if, if funding is cut at the federal level, that could, that could trickle down and mean cuts to, to state governments, to state residents, um, to defense and other contracts, um, but also to federal employees and their compensation. So now that we kind of know what's at stake, let's talk um, about the federal budget and where we are actually in the process of creating it. Um, so here are the five, the five steps that we've broken down um, in the federal budget process. And since we haven't gone through all of the steps in this process since somewhere in the 90s, um, it can be particularly useful to sort of just pause and see what lawmakers are supposed to be doing it and when they're supposed to be getting it done. So after the president releases his federal budget proposal in early February, that's step one, um, Congress begins its months-long process of reviewing that request and then coming up with their own budget plans um, and then agreeing on a budget resolution. So that's really where we are in the process, step two. Um, and a question you might be asking is, what are budget resolutions? And, you know, why is Congress considering skipping this step this year? Um, so budget resolutions set overall federal spending levels and include policy recommendations um, for how to spend that money, but it does not de de designate specific spending amounts for each federal program. So Title I, um, you know, clean drinking programs, it doesn't set specific um, spending levels for those programs. It just says, here's what we can spend on defense, here's what we can spend on non-defense uh, programs. So the specific spending amounts for each federal program comes later in the process, in step three, when we're talking about appropriations bills. So, so where are we? Um, we've heard rumors that the Senate Budget Committee is not going to even bother with the resolution uh, for fiscal year 2017. And you've probably heard that the House has had a lot of trouble putting the one that they released yesterday together. And the main reason for that delay on the House side, they were originally supposed to release a budget resolution back in February, um, but it's, it's been a few weeks now, um, and they finally released it yesterday. So the main reason for the delay is that those in the Freedom Caucus, um, those in Congress who, who are ideologically on the very far right, um, they believed that the spending levels in 
the House budget were too high and um, we're really keen on adding an additional $30 billion in spending cuts on top of the cuts that we're going to talk about that are already in their budget in just a minute. So the reason that Congress might be inclined to skip step two um, in the process this year is that we passed the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2015 back in October. Um, and that put in place spending caps for both domestic and defense discretionary spending for 2017. So that could make passing a budget resolution um, that sets spending levels, overall spending levels, a bit redundant, right? So, but it's still an important step for Congress to take each year because it, it, it also includes policy recommendations, right? So it says we should be spending, you know, this amount on, you know, school nutrition. Um, and it also is important to pass because it provides an open and transparent process um, that average people can follow and engage in. Right? If we're skipping steps, people don't know where we are, people get confused, um, and they don't have the power to, to voice their opinions. Um, so while lawmakers not completing steps in the federal budget process might seem sort of business as usual, it, it really is a big deal, and especially this year. Um, and that's because, you know, one of Paul Ryan's um, big promises when he took his new seat as speaker was to really return the House to, to regular order when it comes to the federal budget process. You know, they criti he criticized um, previous Congresses for not being able to get through these five steps and promised that, that appropriation, that everything would go according to regular order. Um, and that means agreeing to a budget resolutions before uh, turning to those appropriations bills. But, you know, we're already seeing that that might not happen. Um, so if we were following regular order, um, the president submits his budget request to Congress in February. The um, a final joint budget resolution would be reached um, by April 15th, so just just three weeks away. Um, and then after a joint budget resolution is passed, work begins on the appropriations bills, and that's usually done in June um, for the president to to sign those bills, and then we have a federal budget for the upcoming year. So that's sort of the simple version of how, how things are supposed to work and where we currently are. Um, but of course, there, there are a lot of politics at play. Congress is more divided than ever. And because of their inability to agree on how to fund the government, what we often end up with are continuing resolutions which temporarily fund the government for, for short periods of time. So now that we got the gist, um, of how this is supposed to work. Let's talk about the highlights and key points in each of the three major budget proposals, starting with the president's budget. So the president's budget by far gives us the most information, um, and that makes a lot of sense um, since it has the Office of Management and Budget at, it, at its disposal, um, OMB. So this slide shows how the president would propose spending $4.2 trillion in 2017. Um, so highlights from, from the president's budget, he would adhere to spending caps that are laid out in last year's um, Bipartisan Budget Act of, of 2015 um, for fiscal year 2017. Um, and, and the Bipartisan Budget Act provided temporarily, uh, sorry, temporary but partial relief from sequestration in fiscal years 2016 and 2017. Um, and then in, in fiscal year 2018, uh, sequestration cuts are set to return once again. So the president proposes eliminating sequestration um, from, from 2018 to 2021 when it's in effect. Um, so he wants to get rid of uh, sequestration entirely, um, both for domestic and Pentagon spending. And that's something that he has proposed for uh, the last several years. He doesn't like those sequestration cuts. Um, the president's proposal would also make um, important investments in a lot of domestic spending needs. So education, infrastructure, jobs programs, um, and his education programs specifically um, are his signature preschool for all initiative um, and that provides universal pre-kindergarten to every child and provides two free years of community college for all students. Um, he proposes a clean transportation package that would invest about 30 billion dollars each year for 10 years um, that would create hundreds of thousands of good paying jobs and 
while we do sort of see some modest domestic spending proposals, um, it's important to know that the president also invests in the Pentagon and in war spending. Um, and so he provides the Pentagon with about a $2 billion raise over 2016 spending levels. Um, and his proposal would provide billions in the Pentagon slush fund or its war fund above and beyond what it needs to combat our most immediate threats to national security. So for example, it, it allocates $59 billion in, um, in slush fund funding or war funding, and we'll talk about um, why we call it a slush fund in just a minute. Um, but of that $59 billion, it only provides $7.5 billion for operations against ISIS. Um, so the President's proposal would also increase uh, fairness in the tax system by closing tax loopholes that benefit corporations and the wealthy, um, such as uh, reforming the capital gains tax that is mostly enjoyed by the top 1% of earners. Um, and this would really sit well with Americans who say that corporations and the wealthy don't pay quite enough in taxes. Um, and although the proposal increases spending on a variety of initiatives, it does uh, call for $2.9 trillion in total deficit reduction over 10 years. And that's done mostly by raising revenues um, and implementing immigration, and health, and other reforms. So next up is the House Republican budget. And as you can see by this image here, uh, the name of the game is a balanced budget. Um, they, they focus very much on what, how much more they would do to reduce spending um, and reduce deficits than the president would. So specifically in the House budget, it, like I said, it, pri it prioritizes deficit reduction and calls for um, about $7 trillion in deficit reduction over 10 years. And that's done mostly by making cuts to, to programs that Americans care about. Um, and it does claim to reach a surplus in the year 2026. Um, the proposal adheres to spending caps that, um, that were laid out in the Bipartisan Budget Act just for 2017. Um, but then it would revert to sequestration caps, uh, which are more severe for, for domestic spending. So it would cut about $887 billion. That's, um, that's a rounding error why it says eight, eight, 886 on the slide. But, um, it does round to 887, so sorry for that typo. Um, so it would cut 887 billion over 10 years from domestic spending programs below the sequestration caps, um, and would apply to things like education, uh, job training programs, infrastructure programs, and this would really not sit well with uh, what polling shows that Americans want, which is investment in um, in these domestic initiatives. So another important thing to note is that the legislative language of this House budget resolution also states that lawmakers have to consider legislation that's going to cut about $30 billion for mandatory spending programs over the next two years, or about $140 billion over the next 10. Um, and that would apply to, to programs like food stamps, TANF, Medicare, stuff like that. Um, the House budget would also convert the food stamp and Medicaid programs to block grants that would be administered at the state level, um, which would cut substantially funding for these programs um, and provide more uh, of a burden on the states to, to administer those. The proposal also takes on what it calls comprehensive tax reform, um, and it would lower tax rates for the wealthy and corporations, but it doesn't really specify what those tax rates would be. Um, and this really wouldn't sit well with what polling shows that Americans want um, because they say that corporations and the wealthy don't pay enough in taxes and this talks about reducing um, tax rates. And then finally, the, um, the proposal also prioritizes war spending um, and the Pentagon well above domestic spending. So while it's cutting domestic spending by $887 billion over 10 years, it's increasing Pentagon spending by $247 billion over current law over the same time period. Um, one issue I want to mention is that in the House budget proposals, you know, it balances on paper, but it, it relies on some budget gimmicks to get there. So for example, this proposal says that, you know, spending cuts and tax cuts are going to spur economic growth and job creation, but the truth is we just 
we just don't know what the impact is going to be. So whether the budget actually balances um, or reaches a surplus by 2026 really remains, uh, remains to be seen. So finally, we have the Congressional Progressive Caucus budget, um, or the CPC budget, the People's Budget. So this budget would repeal sequestration uh, for both the Pentagon and domestic discretionary um, spending for 2017 and beyond. Um, so while the President's budget and the House budget sort of stick to the bipartisan um, budget acts uh, caps for, for 2017, um, the CPC budget says, nope, I don't want um, spending caps for 2017 or any year. Um, so while it does remove caps for, for both defense and domestic discretionary, it does plan to cut um, Pentagon spending over 10 years. So that's something um, important to note. The other two budgets would increase Pentagon spending over 10 years, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Um, so the CPC budget would make major domestic spending investments in 2017 and beyond, um, including a $1 trillion proposal that would transform infrastructure and create millions of jobs. Um, the CPC budget um, says that it's going to create 3.6 million jobs um, by 2026. This proposal would also follow the president's lead and implement uh, preschool for all, uh, free community college, and it would also allow students to refinance their, uh, their student loans much like you could a house or a car. Um, this proposal is also the only one that would completely eliminate the Pentagon slush fund um, or the war fund after a drawdown of troops in Afghanistan in fiscal year 2016, um, specifying that wars have really been uh, costly and unsustainable. So it's, it's notable for that because it's the only budget that would eliminate that slush fund. Um, and finally, it would raise significant new revenues and it would do so by closing a variety of tax loopholes that benefit corporations and the wealthy. Um, and that helps to pay for, for its increased domestic spending. And, and again, as polling shows, this, this would really be popular among Americans. Um, so next, we're going to talk a little bit about military and non-military discretionary spending in each of the proposals. So I want to provide um, just a little bit of historical context um, on what this looks like over time. So domestic discretionary spending includes things like education, infrastructure and roads, climate change initiatives, clean drinking water, stuff like that. Um, and military discretionary spending, on the other hand, includes the Pentagon's base budget, nuclear weapons, um, other related activities, as well as war funding. So under the President's budget proposal, we would spend about $623 billion on the Pentagon um, in 2017, and about $527 billion on domestic programs. So as you can see, both of these lines sort of trend upwards um, over time, but if you'll notice, in the decade after September 11, 2001, military discretionary spending grew by more than 50%, while uh, domestic discretionary spending grew by only 13.5%. So we can see domestic spending got a little boost um, in the Recovery Act in 2009, but it's really dropped down right back to where it was um, after it expired. So it's clear to sort of see over time that, that military and Pentagon spending has been prioritized over time. So now with this in mind, let's, let's look at what um, each of these budgets proposes for, for Pentagon funding. So on Pentagon and war funding, about 59% of Americans say that we spend the right amount or too much on national security. Um, and another uh, brand new poll shows that um, a majority of Americans would actually support cutting the Pentagon's budget by as much as $12 billion, and they uh, sort of target specific programs like the F-35, like nuclear weapons. Um, so as you can see from this chart here, there's not huge differences between these budgets um, in fiscal year 2017, but what's really interesting is when we start talking about um, what it looks like over 10 years. So President Obama's budget would spend about $551 billion on the Pentagon and related activities in 2017. Um, so it adheres to those bipartisan 
budget cap acts, um, sorry, the, the bipartisan budget act caps on defense spending. Um, and he also proposes $59 billion um, on war, including $7.5 billion specifically on the fight against ISIS. So back to why we call this a slush fund, the Pentagon slush fund. Um, we call it a slush fund because it's often used for things that are not necessarily war, right? Like, so this was created, um, this fund was created to put money uh, aside for the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And it has since morphed into a slush fund where Pentagon really uh, just puts aside money that uh, it can't put in its base budget due to the, um, to the spending caps that have been in place over the last several years. Um, and well, that, that there's at least $115 billion over time since 2001 that has not been used for war, that has been used for any number of other things. Um, so that's why we call it a slush fund. And note that anything in this slush fund is not subject to caps, um, to spending caps that are put in place for, for Pentagon discretionary funding. So all three of these budgets provide $551 billion so they're all adhering to, to spending caps um, for 2017 for the Pentagon. But President Obama and the House Budget Committee would provide an additional $59 billion in OCO. And that totals about $610 billion um, for the Pentagon and for war funding in, 20, um, in 2017. So the, the CPC budget would still provide that $551 billion for the Pentagon in 2017 but it completely eliminates the Pentagon slush fund um, after fiscal year 2016. So it, it means that all of its funding, all of the Pentagon's funding has to go back into the base budget. Um, and so that's, that's really important to note. Um, so the CPC budget wants to fund the complete withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan this year in fiscal year 20, um, 2016, and then it would completely eliminate um, the Pentagon slush fund thereafter. So like I said, things really get interesting when we start looking at um, funding in the long term. So I didn't quite have enough time to get a chart together for this because um, we just got numbers for the House budget yesterday, so I hope you'll bear with me. Um, but after 2017, um, the President's budget would increase Pentagon funding by about $285 billion over 10 years compared to current law. Um, and the House would similarly increase it um, by about $267 billion over the same time period. But they both would allocate funding to the Pentagon slush fund above and beyond um, these, this additional spending that they're providing. So the CPC budget would allocate, um, substantially less, it would allocate about 80, $84 billion above the current law for Pentagon spending. But remember, it's moving all of the funding into the Pentagon's base budget and eliminating that slush fund. So there's a little more accountability. Um, and it would also mandate that the Pentagon be audited. Um, so all federal agencies are, su are supposed to be subject to an annual audit. Um, the Pentagon has never completed one, uh, let alone the slush fund. Um, so, it would move, so the CPC budget would move everything into that base budget and um, force the Pentagon to be audited. So there would be a lot more accountability in how that funding is spent. OK, so let's switch now to the domestic discretionary spending. Um, and so this chart shows you how each of those budgets would break that down in 2017. So again, the, the president and the House budget would keep to those spending caps that we keep talking about um, from the Bipartisan Budget Act, which is about $519 billion. Um, for domestic spending in 2017. Um, and the CPC budget, like I mentioned, would eliminate sequestration or any spending caps um, and would break through those caps by about $80 billion in 2017 alone. Um, and while the President's budget and the House budget look similar in 2017, they are really wildly different in the out years. Um, and so I wish we had a chart here, but hopefully soon we'll have it. Um, so the President would add $194 billion to domestic discretionary programs over 10 years, um, and that's compared to current law, while the House budget would call for $887 billion in cuts over that same time period. So the President provides um, some modest 
some modest increases. Um, the House budget would provide serious cuts, and meanwhile, the CPC budget would increase domestic discretionary spending by $2.4 trillion over 10 years. Trillion, not billion, 2.4 trillion. So really a big variation in in the figures for domestic spending um, over 10 years with the CPC budget really providing um, the most for domestic spending um, over time. And the House budget really, really um, cutting, cutting that domestic spending. So I want to talk about a couple of, of um, domestic spending programs and see how they sort of stack up. Um, and the first is going to be discretionary spending on jobs in the economy. Um, and the other one is going to be a mandatory spending program. And I'll talk more about that in just a second. So 65% of Americans say that improving the job, uh, job situation is a key priority for the President and Congress this year. And even more, about 75% say that um, the economy is the top issue. So in response to that, the President, as I mentioned, would invest about $320 billion over 10 years in a clean transportation proposal that would create hundreds of thousands of good paying jobs. The House budget doesn't include any new funding for job creation or job training programs. Um, it does include some sort of vague language that says it would reduce um, spending and you know lower tax rates and that would spur the economy and indirectly lead to job creation somehow magically. Um, but the proposal doesn't really provide a lot of detail on how that would work. Um, and so finally, the Congressional Progressive Caucus budget in response to um, this being a top issue for Americans, would invest $1 trillion over 11 years, including 2016, so 2016 to 2026, in a major transportation proposal um, and has other job creation plans in order to create 3.6 million jobs by 2026. So we're starting to see sort of really how different these, uh, these proposals are as compared to, to sort of what Americans want. So, I also want to talk about um, changes that are made to mandatory spending programs under these budgets. And so while Medicaid is, is not subject to the annual appropriations process, you know, these budget proposals do consider total spending. So that includes mandatory and discretionary spending. Um, and, and the House budget in particular could mean big changes to, to mandatory spending. Um, so a lot is at stake, uh, particularly with Medicare, and, and it's worth looking at. So 63% of Americans say that Medicaid is an important government program, um, and another poll <clears throat> shows that a majority of Americans uh, say that it's up to the federal government to ensure that people have health insurance. So people really care about um, care about Medicaid. So the the president and the CPC budget would both maintain the Affordable Care Act. Um, and that includes the Medicaid expansion that's already been implemented in 32 states. So the president's proposal would also extend the three years um, of federal support, uh, federal support to the states to expand their programs. So that means that states can still file, uh, still file for those expansions and get federal support. So the House budget, on the other hand, would block grant Medicaid and convert it to a program that's administered at the state, at the state level. So we talked about that earlier, but what does it mean? Um, it provides a larger burden on the state, um, and it would also slash $1 trillion from Medicaid over 10 years, a trillion dollars um, from that low-income program that people, that people rely on. So the House budget proposal would also repeal the Affordable Care Act, and that includes the Medicaid expansion um, that, that's in the states, and that means that an estimated 14 million Americans would either lose their health insurance or be prevented from getting it in the future. Um, and on top of that, if that wasn't enough, one trillion in cuts to Medicaid, um, you know, millions of Americans losing their health insurance, the House budget also specifies that an additional $30 billion over the next two years, or about $140 billion over the next 10 years, um, be slashed for mandatory spending programs. And that means that Medicaid could be cut even deeper. So again, you can really see how different these proposals are in terms of in terms of their priorities. 
So this slide shows um, the priorities of Americans according to just one poll by, by the Pew Research Center. Um, so we know that the economy and jobs are sort of a top priority for Americans as well as um, addressing terrorism. Education, safety net programs, um, and ensuring Social Security and Medicare are, are sound um, are sort of top issues for Americans this year. And what we can see um, just from looking at this one poll is that you know, in, in major federal budget areas, the House budget really misses the mark um, in responding to, to most of Americans' priorities, um, while, the, while the Congressional Progressive Caucus budget does the most to address uh, what people say they want, which is job creation, uh, reduced Pentagon spending, investment in education and other domestic priorities, um, as well as ensuring that uh, safety net programs remain in place for the people who need them. So what happens next? Um, the House and Senate have to figure out sort of, you know, whether they're going to be able to pass a budget resolution um, and whether they're going to do it on time, which is by April 15th, according to the timeline. Um, and so we should know more tomorrow or Friday about whether the House budget will come to the floor next week for a vote uh, before the members of the House leave for Easter recess. Um, so they're, they're marking up the, the bill today. It's likely it's going to make it out of committee and to the floor um, next week. But, but you know, late-breaking developments could, could change that um, over the next few days. So if, if the House does vote on the House budget, we can expect them to also vote on the CPC budget and any other budget proposals that are, um, that are proposed as alternatives to that House budget. And once we have, once they vote on it and, and hopefully agree to a joint budget resolution, um, work can begin on the appropriations bills, uh, which as I mentioned again, set spending levels for each program. Um, and I don't know about you, but I'm crossing my fingers um, and hope that Congress can fulfill sort of this major responsibility to fund the government and to do so in a way that reflects uh, people's priorities and in a way that's transparent and allows Americans, uh, regular Americans, to, pro to provide their input. So, so the vote's still, um, you know, days away. Um, now would be a really great time to let your congressperson know what you think um, so that they can prepare for that vote. Um, so I encourage you all to do that. So that's really it for me. Um, I encourage you to check out our, our website, nationalpriorities.org. Um, national we have a ton of resources. We have a trade-offs tool. Um, we have brand new tax day materials where you can generate a state-by-state -state, uh, or individual tax receipt to see how your tax dollars are spent. Um, we have our fabulous state, state Smart website up and running for those of you who want to see how much uh, in federal dollars comes to your own states. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Kathy Robinson at WAND for her comments and to lead us in the Q&A. Um, this slide has our website again and my email if you have questions that you think of, you know, late at night or after this is all over. Um, so thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Jasmine. That was really, really wonderful. Um, before we hear from Kathy, I just want to remind everyone how to send in questions for Jasmine. Um, you can just type them into the question section of your panel on the right-hand side of your screen, and then I'll ask them aloud uh, to Jasmine. Uh, but first, we're going to hear from Kathy Robinson, Juan Senior Public Policy Director. Kathy? Thank you, Edzie, and thank you so much, Jasmine. Um, we at WAND have been uh, working on trying to focus on budget priorities with the, the mandate from our mission that we need to reduce Pentagon spending and find ways to increase the other investments that are need, needed to put us on a path towards peace and prosperity. Uh, this slide that I pulled up here, that I, 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 just for a moment, and then we'll go back to the slide with the NPP website, because I, I want to make sure that you all have that information. Uh, this is a slide that one of our uh, board members and Oregon WAND chapter leaders put together and I, it won an award uh, for really pointing out that we make some very clear priorities in our budget budgeting process. And 
when you think about it this way, it's, it's a very stark reminder that when you spend money on one thing, and you all know this from your personal budgets, then you have less money to spend on something else. And what we're prioritizing clearly, and much of this is, I think, inertia, because if you look at the, I don't know that this particular budget pie uh, was up, but I'm sure that you've all seen it before, at, at the discretionary spending. And again, this is the, the spending that Congress gets to appropriate each year. Um, of that spending, year, year after year, you see the Pentagon spending, nuclear weapons and wars included, taking up over half of that discretionary budget. So, um, so that's the priority that we're that we're making, and we think that we can make different priorities. But a first step, of course, is understanding kind of this process and what some of the choices that are being made are. And so we're very grateful to NPP for helping us to understand that. And um, let's see, Jasmine, maybe you want to go back to your slide before. Um, I don't I, have the discretionary oh, there it is. It's coming up soon. Um, and I did also just want to say about the, the next steps, which are imminent, um, <laughs> that, that, um, that Jasmine mentioned that the House Budget Committee is meeting today. Uh, they may have just finished up or they may still be going to, to mark up, which means to prepare their, their proposed budget for the floor. And um, it was supposed to be considered on the floor next week, but we really don't know because there's su such a kerfuffle among the, amongst the Republicans uh, about, the, about the budget. And the Freedom Caucus folks, just to be clear, want to cut that, that discretionary spending and some of the mandatory spending as well even deeper than, um, than what the, the House Republican budget does. So. Um, one of the things that we are very definitely supporting at WAND and have endorsed, and I believe NPP has, is the, the CPC budget. And we have an action alert that we can send out to all of you. We hope that you will um, send a note to your House members saying, uh, saying that you want these priorities rebalanced. And the, the House uh, Progressive Caucus budget, the People's budget, is a really great way to do that. I just will say one other thing quickly about the process on the on the House side. A number of bills, you know, you offer particular amendments that you can change things, but with the budget resolution, it's done a little bit differently. So they do not consider, um, you know, amendments to a particular aspect of the budget. You have to offer an entire budget view as an alternative, and so that's what the Congressional Progressive Caucus has done, and that's why we're we're supporting kind of that whole package. So I'm sure that many of you have great questions for Jasmine, and I'm going to just turn it back over to Adzi to read some of those and, and get on with our Q&A here. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, we do have a number of questions. Our first one is from Janet Wheel. Uh, Janet asks, um, are nuclear weapons part of the Department of Defense budget? That's a great question. Um, so, in the numbers that we're talking about in these um, in these Pentagon and war funding numbers in this slide here, we are talking about um, about nuclear weapons. So, nuclear weapons uh, are typically housed in the um, Department of Energy's budget, but these number these 551 billion dollars numbers it includes the Pentagon's base budget, but also other related military. Um, funding such as nukes. So, great question. Thanks, Jasmine. Our next question is from Tim Farnsworth. And Tim asks, would the proposed Navy Strategic Deterrence Fund act, mu act much like the Pentagon Flush Fund, and how would it affect the overall defense budget? Ooh, that is a, a terrific question that I unfortunately don't know the answer to off the top of my head, and I wonder if Kathy has um, thoughts on that. Um, so this special fund for the, the submarine is something that, it's a budget gimmick that works really well for the, the different branches of the, of the military. 
So as Jasmine noted, a lot of the nuclear weapons spending, the nuclear warhead spending, is actually within the, the Department of Energy. But the, the, the uh, delivery systems, so in this case the submarines, are within um, the D DOD budget. And, um, you know, submarines are part of, the, the, they go in the ocean, in the sea, so they're part of the Navy budget, right? Well, the Navy budget is being very squeezed by this new uh, nuclear submarine that's being planned, and it's going to overtake the budget. So the idea is, well, let's find a special, a special category for this so we can take it out of the Navy budget, and then we'll have more money in the Navy budget to spend things on the ships and things that are not nuclear. Um, so it's really a gimmick shifting within uh, the Defense Department, and it will only, it could serve to ultimately raise the overall budget, but it t technically doesn't do that within just the, the creation of a new fund. It's just, it's a gimmick that really allows the shifting of spending. And of course, now, um, you know, it's like, well, the, the missile silos and the, and the bombers are actually special things. So let's take them out of the, the Army budget. And let's take them out of the budget categories that they're in. And just kind of, it's like a, a big game of, uh, a big shell game, sorting things around. But it's very unclear exactly how much, if anything, it'll add to the overall Pentagon spending budget. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, our next question is from Thomas Nowak. Um, Thomas asks, is reconstruction and support for Iraq part of the Pentagon budget? If not, where do those funds come from? That's another really great, great question. Um, and I would have to do a little more digging on that. I want to say that it is in the, the Pentagon base budget and other related spending because it would technically probably qualify as uh, foreign assistance or assistance to foreign militaries, um, which would be included in these, in these $551 billion numbers. Um, but if you do want to email me at jtucker at nationalpriorities.org, um, we can follow up after the webinar is over and, and I can confirm that and double check it for you. Thanks, Jasmine. Um, our next question is from Diane Valentin. Um, Diane says, it's amazing that they can come up with these gimmicks, these budget gimmicks, but can't see their way clear to providing an independent audit. Um, as advocates, what can we do to urge that an audit takes place within the Pentagon? Yay, audit the Pentagon. Uh, this is something that, that seriously that should have been done years ago. And we're not even, I mean, it, we're not even asking for a lot, right? Like it can be a closed door audit, um, you know, top secret clearance people are in or whatever, whatever they require as long as, um, as long as there's some accountability uh, for this. So, I mean, I would certainly urge um, contacting your member of Congress um, and, and also, you know, supporting the, the, the CPC budget is a great way to do that because it is the only budget that, that would audit the Pentagon um, and would do it for the first time, right? So there are also um, a couple of campaigns, you know, audit the Pentagon. Um, there, there's a couple of campaigns who, who do do some work around this. Um, and I don't know, Adi, if you want to um, connect connect folks with, with some with some people who, who do work around this and who sort of organize these campaigns. Yes, definitely happy to. Um, so our next question is from Terry Given. Um, Terry asks, um, can you repeat the name of the Pentagon Slush Fund and explain more about uh, what it's used for and the kind of programs that it funds? Yes. Um, so the Pentagon Slush Fund is technically called the Overseas Contingency Operations Fund, um, or OCO. So OCO was originally created, as I mentioned, um, to, to set aside Pentagon funding um, above the Pentagon's base budget um, for, for the wars in Iraq and for the, the war in Afghanistan. Um, so now that we're sort of drawing down those wars, um, 
and of, and of course we still have you know operations against ISIS that's still a growing threat but think about it right so if we have 59 billion dollars requested for OCO in 2017 and if ISIS is our biggest threat and we're only going to use 7.5 billion dollars of OCO for ISIS that leaves us with five you know 51 billion dollars 51.5 billion dollars um, and, and of course, you know, some of that is going to be, you know, well used and is going to, you know, help fight, you know, real terror and, and that, you know, there is, you know, we do think some of that money has to be used um, responsibly. But for example, um, you know, funding for the F-35 is in, is in, um, is in the, is in the President's OCO uh, request. And, you know, as, as we mentioned before, uh, or maybe we didn't mention it, but the F-35 doesn't even fly, right? It's it's um, it's over budget. It's well past due. It hasn't been used in wars, um, and you know it's difficult to think about the F-35 in particular as combating um, ISIS. You know, in in their pickup truck. You know, like it's difficult to see how the money is being used well um, on the F-35 in OCO. So. So you know that's just one example um, of ways that that we know that that OCO is being used as a slush fund. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, the president originally requested you know something like I'm just going to make up a number, but basically he said you know I want 600 billion dollars for the Pentagon, and you know spending cap said well you can only have 520 billion, and he said okay well I'll take my 520 billion. And then I will also add 80 billion to OCO so that I can have my 600 billion, right? Because the the OCO that this Pentagon slush fund is not subject to cap, so it's really a way uh, for the Pentagon to sort of set aside money to stash money there um, that they think that they'll want. Um, and we have absolutely no idea how that money is spent, right? Because the Pentagon isn't subject to an audit, um, and neither is is the is the slush fund. So. You know, there, there's a lot of gimmicks things happening there, um, and and very little accountability. And there's a lot of waste, right? So in the Pentagon itself, right, we hear you know every week there's something new. You know, millions of dollars on a gas station, thousands of dollars on hammers or whatever it is. Um, so we we really should be skeptical about about uh, Pentagon funding and especially about OCO funding. Thank you so much, Jasmine. I think we are just about out of time. I just wanted to thank everyone who joined the webinar from home. We appreciate your participation and your questions. And thank you again to Jasmine for this great presentation, and especially pulling it together um, at the last minute with the most recent budget proposal that came out. Uh, so again, this webinar is going to be recorded and posted on our website. We'll also email you the link. Um, and please feel free to share that uh, with anyone who may not have been able to join us today. So again, uh, we thank you. We appreciate your participation and we hope that you'll join us for a webinar again soon. Thank you.